keep the interaction going with you, I'm gonna ask you all to raise your hand for a second and keep them up here. I've got a question for you. How, keep your hand up if you like to see things get done quickly. And just to clarify, you like to see the right thing with the right quality get done quickly. Good, everybody's hands are still up, that's good. I expect our leaders think the same way. Now, I want you to really be honest with this next one. Keep your hand up if you struggle with being patient with that process when you think about delivering quickly. Wow, a lot of people struggle with patience as well. I'm, I'm the same way, you can put your hand down. I've struggled with patience all my life and I've had to deal with that for like ever. When we started our agile journey, for me, I was ready, I was on board. Tomorrow, it was gonna start, no questions asked. The challenge is, not everybody else was there. And not everybody else really understood why we were doing this type of change. And that was a bit of a struggle for us. Because as a large organization, and the larger your organization is, the harder it is to change, and the longer it takes to change. So for me, as someone that's rather impatient, I kind of struggled with this for a second and had to take a step back and revisit this. Now, when I think about making that kind of change at Target, what we found is a way to accelerate this process because change can be extremely difficult for teams and can be difficult for an organization. That acceleration came through the form of the Target Dojo. So what I'm gonna go through with you today in my talk is I'm gonna share with you, where did we start? What did we look like before we went on our transformation? I'm gonna give you a history lesson about the birth of the dojo. And then the meat of my talk is gonna be on the mechanics and operations of the dojo. What did teams go through? What did they get out of this experience? How do we operate that for them? Then I'm gonna wrap it up with a couple success stories and leave you with some, some parting thoughts. So first, let me introduce you to Target. Target started in 1962 as a large retailer. We have over 1,800 brick and mortar stores and a large online presence, which is ever growing. We are the second largest importer in the US and we have 39 distribution centers. And we have over 350,000 team members that work at Target. Now, my name is Travis Quinker. I am the director of our Agile and Engineering Enablement. We are a team of enterprise coaches that support the entire corporation. We don't support IT just only, nor just a given line of business. It is the entire company that we support in our role. We also operate the Target Dojo. So let's get familiar with where we started. Our culture, our culture was very traditional in the way that we work. We were very much a command and control style to our type of work. We had hundreds of multi-year projects that were going on at any given time. We operated in silos, and we even had COEs for all the respective roles. If anything was to get done, it was done in the project format. We'd pull individuals from those respective COEs together, they would deliver whatever was expected of them, and they would disband and go back to their COEs. And that was just the pattern that we had. But there was two problems with this. The first one was, we pulled these projects together with these teams. If they were together for a lengthy period of time and became really high performing, when we disbanded them, we lost all that. And that, would, that didn't feel good. We now operate in a product operating model. We have durable teams that support products. These products might be one team, it might be seven teams, it could be 14 teams. It truly depends on the size of the product itself. Now the second problem we had with the projects is our project teams rarely ever interacted with the real customer. Now in our product model, everything is customer centric. That's what we deliver against. Our outcomes are to deliver that expectation of the customer, which is a huge change. The other thing that we had in our organization is we were heavily dependent on contractors. Our IT organization, the entire staffing was at least 75% contractor based. Today that number is under 10%. The other thing is people were allocated to multiple efforts. I'm sure you've seen this, 20% here, 40% there, and so on and so forth until I was at least, at least 100% allocated. We had tons of bottlenecks. Departments depended on other departments and it just held things up. We had long wait times. And we had heavy governance to slow down our ability to deliver value to our customer. And we had zombie projects and programs. These are those efforts that we continued to funnel money into that never delivered value. 
Nothing came out of it. And we started losing visibility to these. And we couldn't kill them. They just kept going. So we kept spending money. So our ecosystem was rather complex. And I think of it as trying to be a character navigating this picture. Where do I go next? Right? How do I change that? So that was the environment we lived in. Do any of those themes sound familiar to you? All of them? OK, good. So we weren't alone. That's awesome. The thing for you to be aware of is you're not alone as well. This is where we started from. And this is all improved significantly. So late 2013, the seed of the dojo began. We didn't know we were going to create a dojo. We didn't know what this was going to be. It just evolved as a result of one leader. One leader who wanted to improve a process that was hurting us. And it was simple. Procuring a server for development teams to install their applications on. That's all it was. But this process took nine months. A huge waste of time, right? So what he did is he pulled representatives from each of the teams that contributed to this process, which is well over 10 teams. Brought them in, the value stream mapped out the process to understand where do we have opportunities to improve this. What you see on the screen right here is just one sliver of that larger process. And in this sliver, we had 98.8% waste. Only 1.2% of that process was actually productive. That's, that's horrible, right? That's absolutely horrible. So what we did is we pulled representatives from those teams that had the skills to start addressing the problems that they identified and experimenting with ways to improve that process. And it proved to be extremely successful. These teams started acting as scrum teams working in short iterations to solve these problems. It wasn't anything magical, it just happened to work. It was co-location, it was collaboration, it was learning skills from others so I could cover them when they're gone. This was so successful that they were able to improve the process associated with the problems they were trying to fix. So we disbanded them and they went back to their former teams. <laughs> now, these people were energized and excited about the experience they just went through because they learned other skills. They saw the big picture and knew how they could impact that. So they wanted to bring that back to their former teams. But here's the problem, those former teams didn't go through this experience. They didn't understand what just happened. And therefore, those people lost their way and kind of fell back into old ways of doing things. But we knew we stumbled across something that was real and powerful. So we decided to repeat the process, but instead, this time, we brought whole teams in and immersed them in this type of experience. And this is now what is essentially the dojo. The dojo is an immersive learning environment where groups of people will bring their real work they're paired up with an agile and an engineering coach, and they're immersed in new thinking and new ways of working that are based off the mindset of product lean, agile, and DevOps. Bring that all to bear for them. Now, my team, our team of coaches, we nurture this experience. We nurture this journey for Target. And this is our mantra. We make Target more effective, efficient, and joyful by partnering with teams and leaders to educate, connect, and coach the entire enterprise as one team. And we commit to make everyone that engages with us measurably better. That's what we do. And this is the one thing. There's learning and doing that happens in our dojo, which sets us apart from training in the classroom or training dojos that I've heard of outside of our four walls. So how does this start? You've got the history, you know how the dojo was created. Let's walk through what we do from a dojo perspective. And it all starts with a consult. This is a 30-minute conversation with the group that is looking to adopt new ways of working and new thinking and, and learn new skills. And this is a conversation where that we work on getting shared understanding on three main things. The first one is a shared understanding of what is the dojo. And the dojo is a learning environment with your real work. That means you're going to have to slow down a little bit in order to speed up. And you're doing the work. We're not doing the work for you. So don't come in here thinking we're going to solve all your problems by doing it for you. You're going to solve your own problems. 
The second thing is to get a shared understanding of that specific group. What do they do? What's their purpose at Target? And is their purpose aligned with Target's purpose? And are they aligned to Target's architectural strategies when they go to deliver their solutions? If they're off course, we want to pull them back in and get them on the right path. The third thing is a shared understanding around what to expect when an engagement happens. Now that we've got information around this team, we can help tell them, hey, this is the type of engagement that's going to work best for you. And these are the expectations we have of you. And these are the expectations you can have of us. It's a time commitment to come into the dojo and work with us. We don't want to waste your time, and we definitely don't want to waste our own time. Upon completing a consult, we move into our charter. This is we get the team in, we figure out the duration, and the first thing we do is, what's your elevator pitch? If you don't have one, we'll help you create one. Because we want you to be able to articulate to anybody that asks you, what value do you bring to Target? Why should your team exist? Upon completing that, we go into a community map. We help them understand who really is, who are your sponsors, who's funding you, who's, who wants to know the progress around the outcomes that you're delivering against. And then we move into their customers, who are the people that are going to use what you deliver and can provide you valuable feedback to make sure your outcomes are really aligned with what you should be delivering. And then finally, who are those builders? Besides yourself, who might be contributing to the outcomes you're trying to deliver against? Upon completing that, we move into our goals and measures. This is, what are the goals that you have that you want to accomplish coming into this dojo engagement? We expect that they have at least two goals. The first one is around customer value. What value are you going to deliver against while you're in this engagement? The second one is around a group learning. What is that learning you're going to get from this experience and want to get from it? And then we help them define objective measures to understand whether or not they've actually accomplished those goals. Upon completing the goals and measures, we'll move into a skills matrix. Now, a skills matrix is the group will tell us what skills are absolutely necessary to accomplish these goals that we just set. And that group will tell us which skills they have, which ones they want to learn. And when we look at that, if we see a gap, this is our opportunity to bring the team and the leader to go, how are you going to satisfy getting this skill in this group to deliver against these goals? And where do you want to take it next as far as cross-training the team on it? Once we complete the skills matrix, we have the team create a working agreement. This is their commitment to one another and their opportunity to hold each other accountable for this specific engagement. Now, once we complete the charter, we go into the experience. And the experience starts with the environment, the dojo environment itself. The environment we have for the dojo is our coaching environment. We do not do this in their working environment. And there's a reason for this, and we have a good analogy I'm going to share with you. If you invited me to your house for dinner and I offered to help you wash dishes, if I go into your kitchen and tell you how to wash your dishes, you're probably going to show me the door. But if we reverse that and you come to my house and you offer to wash dishes, you're going to follow suit with the way that I wash dishes, the way that I do them, right? And that's what we see in our environment. When they come to our environment, they're open to the learning, the experimentation to deliver against their outcomes and learn these new techniques for delivering their goals. Now, in our environment, we have a table. People are facing one another. This is really important because this fosters sharing, creation or co-creation and collaboration. The other thing it does is many teams have something unhealthy associated with them. And in sitting in that environment for so long, that unhealthy tension is going to come out. So our coaches will coach them through that because we want those individuals to leave in a better state than when they came in. There's also a plethora of whiteboards in our space. We want to make everything they do physical and transparent. It is important for teams to be able to visualize their workflow, to look at their work and see that up there, and to explain it to their leaders and to their customers. This has been extremely powerful for the business teams we've worked with. When, they pull them up, come, um, when we start their sprints with them and we put their commitments up on the board and we're starting to work with them, we also then start adding all the unplanned work that kind of finds its way in. And these are on different uh, colored post-its. At the end of that sprint, we have a conversation. How do we do? How do we do under commitments? Oh, we didn't achieve those. Well, why? Oh, what's all this unplanned work? 
right? And that allows us to have then a conversation with the team and the leader around on-plan work. How are we gonna tackle this when we go back into our environment? And what really are those priorities and where can we actually say no and get a better understanding of what unplanned work we're not gonna do and which ones maybe we have to and have some trade-offs. Now, in addition, they have a 50-inch TV. This is for them to share, pairing, mobbing. It's an activity for them and a source of, of sharing it with the entire group. Now, in addition to the space, we also have the engagement itself. It's the entire group that comes in, or our entire team, just depending on what we're working with. And it's the people that on, on that team that have those specific roles are part of this too. Your product owner, your scrum master, the leader, customer if necessary, are all there. And we have coaches that coach the entire team, as well as those in specific roles to ensure that they level up in their own skill in supporting that team. And when they're in there, they're operating what we call hyper sprints. These are two sprints a week. So they're doing a sprint in two and a half days. What this helps the team do is figure out how to break down their work into small valuable pieces that they can still deliver. It helps them seek out fast feedback and do rapid experimentation. And the repetitive nature of it cements the behaviors we're teaching the organization. They start to build muscle memory. Now, they do two sprints a week. They also do two sprint reviews a week. This is a picture of one of our demo lounges. This is where the group will invite their customer, their leader, other peers to share what did we learn and what did we accomplish during our two and a half day sprint. Now when they're doing a sprint review, we want groups to understand three main things. The first one we want them to understand is how to talk about customer value. All too often groups want to talk about the work they accomplish, but not necessarily the outcomes it achieved or the value it drove. And this is about building a relationship with your customer. The second thing is around learning or even failures. We want teams to be able to express what they learned during that period of time. All too often, groups want to cancel a sprint review because what they committed to is not what they accomplished. And they're a little scared or embarrassed. But the reality is they learned in that experience. So we want them to communicate that to their customers, to their leaders, because that's still informing what outcomes they're going after and any adjustments they might have to make. Now, the third thing that we teach them is around seeking feedback. It is so important to pull that feedback in to help you continue to align towards those right outcomes. We anchor everything to what we call as, a, as an acronym of PLAD, Product, Lean, Agile, and DevOps. And we throw a little I in there to round out the acronym. And that's innovation. Now, we don't teach innovation in the dojo, but we help teams understand that they're innovators just as much as anybody else, and to keep that in mind and continue to explore. But product is the product management concepts. This is about bringing people, process, data, and technology together with a customer-centric lens to achieve their outcomes. Lean is around maximizing value and minimizing the waste. We pull in the lean portfolio management concepts and teach them about value stream mapping. We help them understand how to write appropriate and productive OKRs, objectives and key results. And as needed, we'll assist them with their quarterly planning process. Agile's the big one. This is the mindset. We're always focused on those values and those principles with the groups that we work with. We want to work in short iterations. We want the fast feedback. But it's about those core principles and values than it is around any type of practice. At Target, we don't mandate or even teach a given framework, a specific framework and say, you must follow this practice. Instead, we teach them the variety of concepts so they can figure out what works best for them. Because what works best for them is what's gonna stick. And that's what we want it to do, is to stick. Now, DevOps, my definition is gonna be different than probably anything you've seen before. Because when you boil it down, we want DevOps to be real for business and technology. So from the business perspective, we teach them about empathy, collaboration, and experimental learning. This is important to us. We do the same thing with the technical teams, but we also layer in the automated tests, the pipeline development, um, and delivering against our architectural strategy by microservices. But we help them with those technical practices on those IT teams. But this is core. This is core to everything we do is around Plaid. Now, when a team is done and we close out our engagement with them, 
we'll do a follow-up. And this follow-up might be at 30 days, 60, 90. It just truly depends on the type of engagement we had with them. And this is the opportunity for teams to share how have they started to incorporate what they learned into their day-to-day -day work. It's also an opportunity for them to get clarification on questions or a refresher if they've forgotten a few things. But they don't have to wait for a follow-up. They can reach out to a coach at any point in time in order to get clarification on anything that they have questions around. So how do we know this is working? How do we know that the coaching in the dojo is actually having an impact? Well, there's two objective measures that we measure for ourselves. The first is a net promoter score on our coaching service. We hold ourselves to a bar of 60 when it comes to NPS. And if anybody's familiar with NPS, it's a pretty high bar when you think about NPS. The second one is a lift in learning. We want to know that each individual had a lift in their competency from what they just went through. So we do a pre and a post assessment. It's the same assessment. What we want to know, was there a lift in competency based on the experience they just went through, given the objectives that we're trying to teach them? Now, in addition to these two objective measures, I will personally reach out to the VPs of the respective areas we've been working with. My intention is to find out what are you seeing that's changing with your groups? Are you seeing an improvement in engagement? Is there more collaboration that's going on? Are you seeing a positive attitude? Are people happy? Those are the things that are really important to me. And we want to make sure we're having that kind of impact. All right, so great. We can measure this from a coaching perspective, but what about the groups that are coming through? Well, I want to share with you a couple business stories for you, two stories. And I can't go into specifics, so I'm going to use some general terms, but you'll, you'll get the picture of what's going on. So the first one was a part of the organization that's on the revenue generating side of our organization. And they have some key customer metrics they constantly are measuring and trying to improve. There was one they were stuck on. For multiple years, they were unable to move the needle on this specific customer metric. So they reached out to us. Could you help us? Are there things you could do that maybe help us improve on this? Absolutely, come on in. We pulled in teams from operations, from business process, from IT, to take a look at this. What could we do to make this better? And we taught them techniques around Plaid, and we started having them identifying what are those problem spots? And what are some potential experiments you can run to see if that actually solves your problem? In literally a matter of weeks, the group was able to identify some experiments, validate them, and put them into practice in order to improve this metric. At the end of it, they improved their metric by 25%. And this was just in a matter of weeks. There was no magic here. We created the environment, the co-location, the collaboration, applying the Plaid techniques, taking a new mindset, help them break through this barrier. Now, the second group that I'm going to talk about was a purely business group, a very large part of our organization. It was 30 process teams that were delivering into a given activity a very important activity for Target as well. Now, these teams had a commitment for their activity. There was an SLA that they had to adhere to. Well, their adherence was at 22%, which wasn't really good. So they reached out to us, same thing. Could you help us with this? Are there things that you could teach us that might make this better? Absolutely, come on in. We brought those teams in over a course of a period of time and taught them around the Plaid techniques. And we helped them figure out Again, that collaborative nature is so powerful when you think about what you're trying to solve. What are those problems? What are the experiments you can run and start validating this? Again, in a matter of weeks, they were able to improve their adherence four times. Four times that multiple, at 88%. And they gained the confidence in what they learned in order to take that back outside of their experience with us and continue to improve. Again, no magic, it's setting the environment and helping them work through this. And that is the thing that's really powerful around what we're doing the dojo, is we're helping teams identify, define, and solve their own problems. It's not up to us to solve their problems, it's up to them to solve these problems. We're just teaching them the techniques to do so. Now, we couldn't do this alone. We had executive support. Our CIO came to the organization a little over four years ago, and he understood the value of, of uh, product, agile, and DevOps. 
And he was going to change the entire the IT organization to put us in a product operating model and apply these, these uh, practices, which was great. We took him on a tour of the dojo, and he, he immediately saw the value. Told all his IT leaders, take advantage of the dojo. Have your teams use this. Have them skill up. Have them get better in ways of working. That was fantastic. But he did one other thing that was really powerful. He held a firm line with the business. He, talk, he talked to the LT team and told them, here's what I'm changing in IT. And by the way, your responsibility is to properly prioritize work. That's all you have to do, properly prioritize work. And I'm going to help you. What he had them do is write down everything that was going on in flight on a post-it and throw it up on the wall. When he was done, they had over 800 initiatives on the wall. He took each one and said, does this contribute to our enterprise strategies? Is this critical to target at this point in time? If it wasn't, it was deprioritized. We ended up moving from 800 plus consecutive projects that were going on at that time to a prioritized backlog and our new product operating model. We could stay focused, we can manage our whip, and we had clarity around some of the projects. Now, in addition to having executive support, it was about building partnerships in the organization. We built partnerships with finance, HR, our, uh, our uh, learning and development team, and our corporate real estate teams, because they could help us make the shift in the culture that we're trying to make as well. And the things that we were able to accomplish as a result of those uh, partnerships over the past four years are, are astonishing. We were able to drive a learning culture. Our teams have uh, the team members have the ability to take 50 days out of the year for their own personal learning. We were able to make some improvements around diversity and inclusivity. We've changed our recruiting habits to focus on, are we bringing in people with that plaid mindset as opposed to just the specific skill? We were able to change our annual funding model. We moved to a position where our funding is based off OKRs, and we have a six-month check-in so that we don't have those zombie projects anymore. If it's not achieving the outcomes we're expecting, let's kill it. We move to a quarterly planning process that everybody's now aligned to. We have a company-wide share-out program, which we call Demo Day. Every quarter, groups can share the work they've accomplished over the past quarter to the entire organization. Anybody is welcome to come look. And they can communicate what they have coming up for the next quarter. We've also started to hold internal conferences with external participation. And this is so powerful because we want people to be exposed to you, the things you're doing, to bring it in so we can get outside of our four walls, but we can bring you into our organization to help educate that. And then finally, we moved away from those corporate uh, cube farms to open pod spaces. So collaboration happens much more naturally. So I want to leave you with some thoughts. As you go on your own journey, realize that this is a journey. It will not happen overnight. And I'm sure none of you have heard a leader say, I want to be agile in three months, right? <laughs> you know it doesn't happen. It is a journey. So be patient. Immerse your teams in that learning and give them some time to adapt to the change. In addition, Make sure that they understand that they really are empowered. Now, you can't let this happen organically, so you have to be persistent. You have to nurture this journey in your organization. So find those partners, seek feedback, and use that to determine where you're going to go next. Experiment and adjust your journey. Find those executive leaders that can be the support for you. These are the ones that are leading by example. Those are the ones you want to latch on to. So they can provide you the air cover if you need, if you run into resistance. And then finally, just do it. Don't think about trying to create a plan for this long term, because it will not unfold the way you think it will. Instead, find your guiding, your guiding North Star, start heading towards it, learn from the experience, and then just adapt and change as needed for your journey. Now, I cut a ton of stuff out of this to make this work in 30 minutes. <laughs> so what I'm going to say is go to dojo.target.com. You can read about our journey. We have it out there. 
And if you are interested in taking a tour and would like a lengthy conversation on this, you can sign up on our site. I think we're gonna go into questions, but if you have questions we don't get to, you can talk to me, Jeremy, raise your hand, Tom, raise your hand. Either one of us can answer a question on a break as well. Thank you.